Welcome to today's lecture. And today we're looking at the life cycle of the honeybee. This lecture was sponsored by Science Foundation Ireland under the Discover 2020 grant call. So firstly, we want to look into a beehive and let's take a look at who actually lives inside there. And here we see a colony and it's quite a strong full colony with a lot of bees inside in it. And you can see here that there's brace comb over the frames as well. And the bees have started to draw drone brood. This colony needs a queen excluder and a super, otherwise it will start swarming. <laughs> So we want to know who actually lives in this box. And here we can see some of our beginners learning how to manipulate and how to work their way through the hive. And it goes without saying, and it's something that we have to keep telling our beekeepers in their enthusiasm. They keep standing in front of the entrance and the bees gather on their backs like you see here. So ideally you find your entrance location first and then place anybody that needs to look into the hive to one side of that. So let's see who actually lives in the hive. And here in this background, before we go any further, we see eggs. These little white pieces here, thin threads here, are eggs laid by the queen. So we have a queen in there. We have workers and in the middle of the season, we have drones. So this is what a worker honeybee looks like, up close and personal. And this worker honeybee, as you can see, is completely covered in hairs. And these hairs are called seta. And these seta gather pollen accidentally or otherwise as the bee visits different flowers to gather nectar. And in the process, the pollen from this bee uh, is deposited in the next flower as the honeybee goes to the next flower. One is a pollen press and it's where the pollen is gathered to bring it back in pellets back to the colony. So there's my wing spread out. Like, like I said, it comes in two halves and there's little hooks here that hook in from one section to the other. Those hooks are called hemoli and there's normally about 20 of them there. So the wing, when it's fully extended then, is the whole lot put together. But when the bee wants to go into the colony, it can fold up its wings, tuck them in underneath it. So it's got four wings, that's two pairs, because these two here are clipped together when they're in flight. So who lives inside in the colony? Well, they all have different faces, like we have different faces, they have different faces. Our queen is here in the middle and she has a different mouthpiece to the worker. Now our queen is female and the workers are female, but her mouth here is completely different to the workers because the workers use that mouthpiece for working, for manipulating wax, for doing lots of other jobs. The queen's mouth is different when you look at her face on. The eyes of the queen and the worker are about the same size. And they have three little ocelli, three more eyes up here on the top. Your drone's eyes are way bigger because the drone needs to be able to see for mating and identify a queen to mate with. So the drone is male and the queen and the worker are both female. So each of them starts as an egg. And here we see an egg up close and it's magnified a number of times. Um, and ultimately this egg, if it's going to be a worker, which would be female, it's going to be fertilized. And that fertilized egg then has 32 chromosomes. 
But if it's a drone, the queen, as she's laying eggs, goes in with her front legs and measures the size of the cell and then decides whether, based on the size of the cell, whether they're going to be workers or drones laid up there. And if it's a drone, it the egg will not be fertilized and it only has 16 chromosomes. So the drone doesn't have a father, but it does have a grandfather because it brings these chromosomes from the mother's genetic line. And the queen is also female. She's going to be a fertilized egg as well. There's going to be 32, 32 chromosomes there. She's laid in a different size cell and she's given completely different feeding. So now let's just take a look at um, what drone comb looks like as opposed to worker comb. So here are the different stages of development from egg to mature bee. Now, when the egg is laid in day one, it's laid straight up like this. So the queen measures the width of the cell. She backs down into the cell, deposits an egg into the bottom or the base of the cell and moves on and lays the next egg. And she can lay in the middle of a season up to 2000 eggs a day. On day three, that egg hatches and it becomes a tiny little larvae. And once it becomes a larvae, it goes to the second stage that we see here. So the larvae is going to be circular or semicircular looking and the bees are going to provision it with brood food. They're going to make the food the, and it's called brood food and they will keep feeding that larvae until it completely fills the cell like you see here. And then when it's completely filled, it leaves off a firm on to say, I have enough of feeding. I'm seven day, days or more, you need to cap the cell. So once the cell then is capped, the larvae goes through a number of stages of metamorphosis. And here you see that particular larvae at the red eye stage over here, which is telling me that it's a day or two short of hatching out. And here's the mature uh, larvae having, or the larvae having developed uh, to a state where it can emerge from the cell. So we'll take a look now at a bee emerging from a cell. So again, here on the right hand side are our eggs and this is a piece of comb that has been cut back to have a look at what actually lives in there. And these here on the left hand side then are larvae at different stages of development. The white substance that's in here around those larvae is brood food and that's what the, the other worker bees feed these larvae so that they can um, hatch out once the, seal is, once the cell is sealed. It takes the worker 14 days to hatch out. So there's enough of food here for 14 days for that larvae to go through the whole metamorphosis stage. So here I'm looking at a frame of brood. It's worker brood. It's laid out from corner to corner. And this is a national frame. And here, what you're looking at here is not a fault, but it's actually the line of the wire that's put in here to support the frame. If we didn't have the wire in there and hot weather, when we lift the frame out, it would kind of collapse in our hands and turn to a mess. So the beekeepers wire the frames and um, the, just when the, the queen then goes in to measure the size of the cell, she notices the wire in the bottom of it and she won't lay the eggs inside where the wire is in her way. So the lines that you're seeing here are wire and that's a really well drawn out and filled uh, frame of brood. So again, when the queen starts laying then, she lays in a concentric pattern, so a circular pattern. So you can see here, there's brood here, she starts in the middle, so she's laid brood here, 
And there, then there's another layer of brood and the outside layer here, which is currently sealed, which is telling me that the brood here is just after emerging. And then she'll come back around and she'll start the process all over again. So she lays in concentric laying patterns um, when you see a queen starting to lay first. So if we were looking to see if a queen is starting to lay, you'd be looking towards the center of a, the, a brood cell in the brood nest. And that's where she'll start and work her way to the outer periphery of the brood nest as she goes along, provided that the colony has enough of worker bees to maintain it. So all these bees we're looking at here are worker bees at this point in time. Again, here, if you look at this bee here, this bee here has a big load of pollen on its hind leg in a pollen pellet, and they're going to put the pollen just out here on the periphery of the brood nest so that the emerging larvae or the emerging bees from here have pollen um, to mature and grow fully so that they can eventually go foraging for honey. They also have the pollen stored here so that when they're feeding the brood that's inside here, they make the brood food with their mandibular glands, which are in their head, and their hyperpharnageal glands, which are in their head. And they'll make the brood food with that, those hyperpharnageal glands and um, that white substance then that we saw in that last frame is the brood food that's made, but the bees need pollen to do it. So again, here's another frame here. The white stuff on the outside here is capped stores or capped honey. In here in the middle of this brood nest, we have capped brood. Then as the queen was moving out along, we have brood in different stages of maturity. Um, this brood here is on the verge of being sealed. And over here, we can see an egg. Here's the larvae after hatching at three days. There's a smaller one even here. It's a tiny little C when you look into it. So it goes from egg to this tiny C to the bigger C to the bigger larvae here. And eventually it's going to fill up the whole cell here and be ready to be capped. And they've capped it then down here with a very flat biscuity looking capping and the variation in the, the cappings here is totally dependent on the type of pollen available at the time coming in with the bees. So let's take a look at the life cycle of the worker honeybee. Day one to three is an egg and on day three that egg hatches. Days three to seven, then that larvae is open and it's developing as we just looked at it. And at the end of day seven for the worker bee, that larvae is sealed. From day seven to day 21, then that larvae goes through a couple of stages of metamorphosis under the cappings and eventually hatches out on day 21. It spends three weeks in the hive doing house duties. And from day 12, it's wax glands develop. And here on the left-hand side, we see a honeybee with wax glands, A4 to A7 underneath the bee here. And it's releasing wax to make wax inside in the colony. So if they wanted wax to cap the honey, they would cap it with pure wax. If they wanted wax to cap the brood, they'd add pollen to it so that the brood could breathe underneath it. And, but there has to be a flow of honey for the bees to draw wax. From around day 18, they start guard duties at the entrance. Um, their sting starts to develop. And by day 21, then they begin foraging. And in the height of summer, they only last about another 21 days, which is three weeks. And their wings wear out and they're gone. So why am I throwing so many dates at you? Well, if we go back here and take a look at it, it took 21 days for the larvae to hatch from the time the egg was laid to the time it hatched. It took another 21 days for it to mature properly inside in the colony, doing various aspects of housekeeping. And it took another 21 days before it died off. So this is really the instructions for moving hives. When the bee 
starts its foraging duties here around day 21. Between day 18 and day 21, it takes what we call practice flights or orientation flights. And those orientation flights, it learns the markers in the general vicinity of the hive so that when it comes within 100 metres of the hive, it knows exactly where the hive is and it will find its way home. So if I need to move my bees, I need to move them more than three miles away for three weeks so that all of the bees that had orientated towards that hive location have after three weeks died out and now I can move my colony back to relocate it in the same apiary. So for example, if somebody comes along to you and you discover you've put your beehive in an inconvenient place in the garden and actually it would be a lot better down at the other end of the garden, you need to find another apiary site for three weeks over three miles away from where your the hive is currently located. So you'd move your hive either very early morning or late in the evening when all the foragers are in and bring it to the new location and leave it there for a minimum of three weeks so that all of the foragers that orientated to that particular location for stay have died off. And when you bring the colony back then, the newer bees that are inside in it will reorientate to the new hive location. The new bees will orientate to the new location and your job is done. So here we're looking at bees then starting to draw out comb naturally. And when they draw comb naturally, they have a tendency to draw bigger cells than the worker cells that you might see here. So these bigger cells are for drone brood. And the, remember the drone is the unfertilized eggs. So when the queen comes along to go laying, she measures the width of the cell, and then she's going to decide whether she's going to lay a worker or going to lay a drone. Your drone takes 24 days to hatch out where your worker took 21. So the life cycle of the drone is similar to the life cycle of the worker bee at the start. So day one is an egg and day three, the egg hatches to a larvae. It's then a larvae from day four to day eight. And at the end of day eight, it gets capped. And it's a pupae from day eight to, 20, to day 24. Now, the drone is there to mate with the queen. So when the drone is born, its reproductive organs, while they're intact, are not sexually mature. So that drone needs a lot of feeding, a lot of pollen, a lot of looking after for the first 14 days so that it can strengthen its flight muscles for uh, flying to the mating area or the drone congregation area. And so that its reproductive organs are sexually mature to mate with queens when the opportunity arises. It can live for up to three months, but once it mates, it dies. Why is that important? Well, firstly, when we see drones being laid up, we know that we're six weeks out from the start of swarming season. This is our text message from the bees. Once they start laying up drone brood, they're strong enough to maintain that drone brood and swarming season will start six weeks later. So this is what a drone looks like. The drone has got a way wider body than the worker bee. It's got bigger muscles here in the thorax, which is the chest. And it's got way bigger eyes so that it can find the, the queen in the sky for mating. Its antenna are longer than the honeybee's antenna as well. And it has six legs like the honeybee, but it has no sting. So it takes 24 days to hatch, another two weeks before he is sexually matured to mate. His main job is to mate with the queen. He has a mother but no father because he's got 16 chromosomes unlike the female workers and the queen, which have 32 chromosomes. He has a grandfather. His grandfather is the queen's father. And at the end of the season, if he doesn't mate with a suitable queen, they will be thrown out of the colony regardless.
Okay, so if we look into a colony then to be able to identify the difference between the different types of larvae and workers and drones inside in the colony, we are here looking at different types of brood. So A here is worker brood larvae, B is a queen cell, and they come in different shapes and sizes. They can be tucked in absolutely anywhere inside in the box. And the, the cappings that are bigger and wider and with more of a domed capping on the top of it are drone brood. And over here then at D, we have eggs. Now here's a photograph of a drone hatching out and what I thought was absolutely fabulous about this uh, photograph was it shows in detail how big the drone's eyes are and that the drone has three extra eyes up here on top for the mating purposes and it lines up with polarized light in the sky and those three eyes there are called ocelli. A queen on a frame with uh, workers. The queen's body is way longer, it's thicker, and she normally stands out in the frame once your eyes get accustomed to looking at her. So her body is a lot longer than the worker bee's bodies, and um, she just walks differently on the frame. It takes a bit of practice to get used to finding her, but once you do, this is what she looks like. Here we have a photograph of a drone just emerging and it's being tended to by a worker. And that drone has its proboscis, which is the, the word we give to its tongue. So its tongue is out begging for food and bees feed each other by extending their tongues and passing the food from honeybee to honeybee. So if we look at them up close and personal, on the right hand side here, we have a worker with its six legs and a pollen pellet here on the pollen basket at the rear and it's covered in bits of pollen on the seta and the hairs as well. And on the left-hand side here, you can see a drone. Its eyes are way bigger. Its thorax or its the big section of its body is way bigger. And it's designed differently to the worker honeybee. So here again, we have a frame of brood and the queen will start laying this brood in a concentric pattern. Here is what we would class as a perfect concentric pattern. She lays around in circle, circle, circle. So this outer one here is after being laid up. We can see this inner section here has emerged and she's laid it up again already. And she will keep going around all the frames inside in the colony to do this. Out here to the left, we have capped honey. And you can see the yellow here is yellow pollen provisioned around the periphery of the brood nest so that the bees inside in the colony can feed the larvae uh, and make brood food to feed the larvae that's in there. And here, I think it explains everything. We have a young honeybee just emerging. You can see it's all furry. It will darken up later once it's kind of dried off, but it emerges really furry and as it emerges in the colony. So what jobs do the workers do? Well, here you can see the workers here attending to the queen. Um, and the queen doesn't feed herself. The workers do everything for her. They feed her, they look after her, they're around with her all the time. Our worker honeybee then goes out and forages for both nectar and pollen. Nectar is the sugar content that the honeybees need in their diet, but the amino acids and the protein are coming from the pollen. So the pollen is really the vital cog here um, for the bee. The bees have to have pollen. Without pollen, they can't build, they can't build uh, the brood nest. Without pollen, they can't feed the brood. So they can, we, the bees can manage without nectar, 
because the beekeeper can supplement the nectar, but really the pollen has to be there for the colony to thrive and survive. And here, just to take a look up close and personal of the actual pollen basket on the honeybee's rear legs. So you can see the, all those specks that are caught there in the hairs, they're all minuscule grains of pollen. And the bee will make a kind of a bolus or pellet out of the pollen and the pollen basket here will press that down and put it into shape. He will comb all the pollen back and add um, some enzymes to it like lactic acid bacteria and a few other enzymes and it will crush the pollen in the pollen press here and then it will be able to carry it back to the colony and when they bring it back then they just shove it into the cells for want of a better word so here's a cross section um taken off the internet of pollen shoved into cells and you can see that they're just bringing the pollen back as it's coming in from different areas from different bees and it's coming in different colors so we've got kind of a greeny gray here and then you've got your oranges and your yellows if you look over here on the right you'll see purple coming in so the pollen is coming back in pellets and it's being shoved into the cells on the periphery of the brood nest to store the pollen for the development of the colony Again, here it's a very good example of all the various different types of pollen coming in in a colony and how they're even getting mixed up here in the, mi the mix. So you've got reds and yellows inside here. You've got whites and something else inside here. And you've got uh, purple has gone in here on top of something else again. So honeybees sting. They do. They have a sting. And... They don't really want to sting you because once they sting, there's a barb at the end of the sting. And when they sting, this uh, whole section comes out and possibly part of their gut entrail as well. The barb and the sting uh, sticks into the skin and that honeybee is ultimately going to die. So to get that sting off, you just scrape it off. If you squeeze it and pinch it, there's still venom in the venom sac here and it will keep pushing or pumping into the skin area here. So to get that out, you just scrape it off. Don't squeeze or pinch. Again, there's another photograph here of the wax glands from A4 to A7. And the bees make wax um, from day 12 onwards. Now, they'll only make wax if they have a flow of honey coming in and they need the wax. Wax is a commodity that takes a huge amount of work to get the wax glands going. And while we in the building line might use laser levels or plumb lines, the bees have their own plumb lines. And this is the bees making their plumb line to draw down that wax in a straight line. So this is how they do it. They hang in what we call festoons and the but colony needs to be left closed up while this is going on. If you go around and keep opening your colony, you're going to break the momentum here of the bees hanging in festoons and slow down the process of wax being drawn. So they have to hang like this for 24 to 48 hours to start drawing wax. That's why the beginner beekeeper shouldn't be opening the hive all the time. And here's the queen. So this queen here is sitting on a bit of honey, it's capped honey, and you can see that uh, she's got a long body, way longer than the worker bees, and somebody has marked this one white here at the top of her. So she would have emerged out of these queen cells here, so that's what a que sealed queen cell looks like, and this is what a sealed queen cell looks like. And when queen cells get charged, they look like this. So they would have a lot more brood food inside in them and the bees would draw them down in a kind of a peanut shape, but they could be any sort of a peanut shape um, anywhere on the frame. So here we see two of them at different stages of development. 
There's a lot, this one is longer than the one here on the right because it's that bit older. And you can see this one hasn't eaten through as much brood food yet, but there's only a small bit of brood food left here. But in general, the larvae inside in the queen cell will have a lot more food provisioned inside there than it actually needs. So we've got a small bit of a video here of a queen hatching. So the life cycle of the queen, again, she's laid as female egg on day one. On day three, the egg hatches. Day three to day seven is a larvae. And at the end of day seven, the larvae is sealed. Now, from a beekeeping perspective, at the end of day seven, if the queen is not clipped and marked, that's when that first swarm will come out of your colony. If the queen is clipped and marked, well, the swarm will come out as well, but they'll lose the queen in the long grass because she won't be able to fly as far as the rest of the colony. And they go back in then and they'll wait for the sealed queen cells to hatch. So you won't lose your colony, but you're going to lose your queen anyway. From day seven to day 16, she's a pupae. And she emerges on day 16. Now she can live up to five years, but most likely it will only be two to three years. So here's a photograph of a queen having hatched out, out of a, this particular queen cell. And you can see that she ate her way out of the, of the top here, but that queen cell closed again after she came out. So you have to be very, very careful about queen cells inside in colonies because sometimes the queen might, might already be out and the queen cell has closed again and you don't realize that the queen is actually gone. So here's the process of the queen hatching out. And again, we've already looked at this on the video. It's the same thing. Here's one I took um, near my own, inside my own apiary at the back of the house. And I had marked the queen and put her into a colony to get mated. And I came home one evening and I saw her flying just around the entrance. And I went for my camera and I got this shot of her flying uh, with a dot on her back. So that's the queen flying here with the dot on her back, heading into the hive entrance that's just out of range of the camera. So again, here we see eggs here in the center of the frame. The queen is laying in a concentric pattern. And the queen here in this on this frame has a yellow dot on her back. So the queen is right here where I'm circling now. We see workers coming in here with yellow pollen and we have pollen all the way around here on the periphery of the brood nest. So this is well provisioned with pollen um, getting ready for this new queen to get laid. So the queens are our central link in the hive and from a beginner's perspective it Take, it can take a new queen up to 21 days to get mated. And she's not going to skip, she's not going to start laying until all the brood has emerged. It also takes her five days after hatching out to build up enough of reserves and for her reproductive organs to get mature. So five and 21 could actually bring that to 26 or 27. And that's a fairly common panic mistake that a lot of new beekeepers make. They read in a book that the queen will have mated in 21 days. It could take anything from 21 to 30 days for the queen to get mated, depending on the weather. If you make up a nuke and put a new queen that's not mated into that nuke, 
she's not going to start laying until all the brood inside in that nuke has emerged. That way, the bees don't have an option. They have to accept her. It also gives her enough of time to mature properly so that she gets mated properly. And in general, she'll be a good queen going forward. But the book says 21 days. I would suggest that you allow up to 30 before you start panicking. If we get over a certain point, if we get over that 30 day mark and 30 is a rough guide, depending on weather conditions, but a queen after that point can go stale or will go stale. She won't get mated and then she'll just become a drone layer because she won't have any sperm to fertilize the eggs. So she lay drones in worker cell after that. <clears throat> The queens, if they're going to make up queens, the egg for the queen is laid in a queen cup. And the bees will feed that egg royal jelly as soon as the larvae emerges. It's going to be sealed at the end of day seven. That's when the bees will swarm. And on day 16, the new queen emerges. So again, here's another photograph of a queen here going in to measure the front of the cell here to see whether she will lay a worker or a drone egg. And obviously this is a worker cell that she's measuring up here. On this frame, it's just a frame of pollen and a frame of sealed or kept honey. There is no brood at all on this particular frame. So what happens if a stock goes queenless? You may have accidentally killed the queen on the last inspection. She might have got jammed in between frames if you weren't paying attention, or you might have done something else to kill her or damage her. Or she may have swarmed out the door with the bees and not returned. That can happen and sometimes does happen, um, especially when you're getting queens mated. A colony might go queenless as well if a flow has stopped or appear to be queenless if the flow has stopped. And what I mean by that is you won't see eggs inside in the colony, but you still need to actually look for the queen because once there's no pollen coming in, the queen stops laying. So, for example, if I had a very wet summer, you will find that as soon as the rain starts, that the pollen stops coming in and the queen stops laying. If there is no queen there and you put in a frame of brood and come back in a couple of days, you will see queen cells like this here being drawn. So the frame of brood went in. The brood has now been capped. Here's the worker brood. Here's the drone brood. And they have made what I would class as scrub queen cells here or some sort of queen cells here on the end of the frame. That's how you tell if there is no a queen inside in the colony. You put in a frame of eggs and come back after seven days and see what's going on. So to put in a frame of eggs, this is what I'm looking for. I'm looking for a frame with some eggs in it and some very young larvae, a small sea like we see here. There's a small bit of brood food around it. There's some bigger larvae here. They're too old for the bees to draw a queen, to start making queen cells out of. This one here is nearly too old as well. But these eggs will hatch out in another two days and then they can start drawing queen cells if they don't have a queen. So you drop in your frame, you come back in a week and in a week, all the brood here will be sealed up because remember there is no queen inside there and they will have started drawing some queen cells from a few of the cells that were there on the frame. Now, if we leave it too long, we end up getting laying workers. And in this particular instance, the laying worker is a worker that is emitting a pheromone that resembles that of a queen because there was no queen in the colony. Uh, but the laying worker, first of all, her abdomen won't be long enough to get right into the back of the cell. So there's a tendency to lay these eggs on the side of the cell and you will find multiple eggs in the cell. Now, be careful here with this one. Because sometimes when you've got a brand new queen that's just been mated, 
she misfires a bit as well and you can find a couple of eggs in the very back of the cell with a brand new queen that just got mated but when you come back the next day the, it will be back to single eggs again whereas with this these are laying workers they're going to turn into some sort of a scrub drone they're not going to be any good for anything and by the time the colony gets to this stage it's really too late to resolve the issue it can be resolved but it's very very difficult to do it for a beekeeper with only one or two colonies uh, so we would normally just get, dump the bees in the apiary and let them go back into another colony within the apiary. And those workers that were giving off the pheromone that resembled a queen will not be left into the nearby hives because the guard bees at the door will stop them coming in, but they will accept the rest of the workers that were in the boxes. So you would end up picking up the colony, going to the other end of the apiary, dumping the bees out and put, taking the boxes away and cleaning them down and sterilizing them. Here we have um, a failed queen or laying workers. And we're going to get this sort of a brood pattern here where we have drones in worker cells. They've got domed cappings. They're scattered all over the place. And um, this colony is doomed as well. 